Hey, Dr. Christensen here. And I want to talk about how fad diets can work. Sometimes. <laughs> Not always, but sometimes. You know, and this comes up a lot. Someone will say, I went paleo and I reversed my Hashimoto's. Or I went vegan and I reversed diabetes. Or I went keto and I finally lost weight. So how could it be that diets that are completely different from one another could yield effective results? You know, they've got tenants that paleo says, grains are bad. Well, many have gone vegan and consumed lots of grains and reversed Hashimoto's or autoimmunity. And then vegan says animal foods are bad. Well, many have gone paleo and consumed lots of animal foods and decreased problems with blood sugar regulation. So how do you make sense out of that? The big overarching concept I want you to think about is that you can do the right thing and you can get a good outcome, or you could do something that didn't work and still get a good outcome. Or you could do something that had three, four steps that did help and a couple steps that weren't important and maybe even one or two steps that were counterproductive, but you could still get a good outcome. You know, super quick story, just top of mind. Um, our, our daughter is a, I guess, young adult, but really like old teenager seems more accurate. And I don't think she'll ever see this, but last night she came over and she was in a state of distress because a piercing had gone awry. She had a piercing in the cartilage of her ear and it was horribly infected. And I said, hey, well, when that was done, didn't they tell you about cleaning it and give you an antiseptic solution, things like that? And she said, well, they did. And I said, well, why didn't you do that? <laughs> and she said, well, I had had a past piercing and I didn't take those steps and nothing happened. So I figured I didn't need to. So that's the logical fallacy. You could do something that might not have been a good idea, but it still worked out okay. Well, that's getting lucky. <laughs> so let's go deep in fad diets. Well, there's some common threads. So in most cases, when someone's diet changes, they're going on higher quality food. They're consuming more vegetables. They're consuming more fiber. They're consuming less sugar. Maybe their food quantity has gone down. Maybe their food timing has gotten better. Another big thing is that just the expectation alone of dietary change often causes big benefits. The other big thing is that you're bringing a lot more mindfulness to the table, quite literally. You know, when you change a diet, it's awkward. You've got to think things through more. And it's not so much you just grab food and go. So those are all some common threads that all the different diets have, which are all powerful. You know, any one of those things by itself can really make a big difference towards improving health. And a general theme too, I think, is that most of the fad diets have some strong, positive, well-documented benefits in terms of what they ask you to include. But the things they ask you to exclude, there's really not as good of evidence about that being as important. Another quick mindset is that you cannot change one part of your diet. I had a big discussion with a dear friend about whether she needed to go gluten-free or not. And I'll talk more about this, and I have talked a bit about this, but we were discussing a study in which people who had gone gluten-free had higher rates of cardiovascular death. There was more that died of heart attacks than those that did not. And I told her, I said, and her argument was, look, I went gluten-free and I lost weight for a while. I seemed to gain it back though. So in her mind, the change seemed to help. And my point was, you can't do one change in isolation. So let's think about that one. So let's say that here's a silly diet and it's gonna be half white bread, a quarter vegetables, a quarter lean protein, just to illustrate a point. So let's say someone like that went gluten-free. Well, if that was the only change they made, they actually lowered their whole food intake radically. You know, their, their total fuel intake might have gone down by 50%. That's a big change. And even independent of food quality, just reducing the amount of fuel from fat or carbohydrate has huge benefits in many circumstances. But that's not all. So you took that one chunk out. Well, now your diet went from 25% vegetables to 50% vegetables because all you did is took that thing out and now there's more proportionate vegetables than there were before. That's also a big change. In the real world though, when you make that one change, more often than not, you add something else back in. And that's also a change. Now this is a new food that you're eating that you weren't eating before, or a food you were eating before that now you're eating more of. 
back to that gluten study, so the higher rate of cardiovascular death, believe it or not, I've heard many state objections saying, well, if someone went gluten-free, maybe they ate more processed food, or maybe they ate more gluten-free junk food. You know that's possible. In this study, however, they did look at that variable, and they did look at overall dietary quality. And factoring in dietary quality, changes in body weight, changes in cholesterol, total fiber intake, glycemic load, physical activity level, general healthfulness, all these things factored in, still cutting out gluten caused more cardiovascular death. What they did see that the, the biggest predictor for who and which way was the degree to which they decreased their intake of whole grains. There were some people that went gluten-free that had a fair amount of whole grains still in their diet. They didn't see the same rate of cardiovascular death as those that just cut out gluten. And a thought there is, in many cases, people go grain-free altogether. So that could have made things worse because those are the ones that had the most cardiovascular death. Okay, so back to the, back to the fad diets. A lot of ways they can work, and that was a few of those. But in most cases, they don't last. And I saw this myself firsthand way too many times. And I'd love to talk about fad diets like some brilliant logical outsider that never got caught in a trap, but that's not true. I was in so many of those traps. You know, there was, uh, this was mostly like age, hmm, late teens, early 20s, and the same diets that are faddish now were not then, but many were. I, I did really hardcore on macrobiotic, on sattvic yogic diets, uh, vegan, raw food, vegetarian, also Atkins, and even the keto versions of Atkins. Paleo didn't exist then, caveman diets did exist. I played with those. There was even one, uh, the Gerson diet was used for various purposes, most famous for cancer treatment. And there was one version of it that was, not all were like this, not all versions were like this, but one was just raw liver and collars. And that was probably the very worst one of all, of all the diets that I had attempted. And to this day, one of the few foods that I don't love is collard greens. And I like all the other greens, even some of the intense ones but I got ruined from consuming so many poorly blended raw liver and collard smoothies for a couple of weeks. So I've done them all. And I get how in the first phase, there's this honeymoon response where you feel like, this is it. Now I know the truth. You know, I'm following the right rules. There's some basic principles that I was not adhering to. And the system seems internally consistent. So there's often this phase in which you're doing so much better. But then it drifts. It never really sticks for all that long. It would always be, I don't know, several weeks, several months. And here's why those things tend to drift. So when you're on it for a while, you start really working around some of the initial changes. And if you focus hardest on the exclusions, like if you go hardcore paleo and your whole thing is, I will not eat grains, beans, I will not eat dairy, and that's it. If your whole diet is around what you're avoiding, your diet quality can drift. Or if you're hardcore vegan, I do not eat animal products, that's my main rubric for choosing foods, the quality can drift over time. And even if it's fats or carbs, I remember back in the low fat day, there was the low fat cheats and uh, pretzels, you know, processed foods, uh, a lot of the high sugar, low fat type snack foods, they were thought to be free foods. And most people that tried to go low fat didn't actually go low fat, they just ate what they ate, but they added processed snacks on top of it. And we see this low carb too. People have their food they consume and they'll add more low carb snacks on top of that. And that could be nuts or cheeses, or now we've got a lot of processed low carb foods and processed paleo foods. So that can happen where your food quality diminishes. And then also the food quantity. Once you get the hang of the new food rules, you know, what's verboten and what's okay, then what's okay you start eating more and more of. And you're not used to it at first, so you don't quite have the hang of how to do that, but they become familiar foods and your food quantity levels start to creep up again. The other pitfall, and the reason why the fads may not last, is your digestive function starts to get impaired. You know, we're omnivores, and the superpower is that there's no food that in its absence we're gonna keel over dead but there's also almost no food that we can't get by on and sustain ourselves for some length of time. But the more narrow our diet is, the more our gut apparatus retools itself to be restrictive and to only do well on narrow food choices. 
And the pitfall about that is we lose a lot of our diversity of our flora. And we also get less robust about making stomach acid, making digestive enzymes. So the narrower the diet is, the weaker digestive function becomes. And people often get boxed into a corner to where there's fewer and fewer foods they tolerate. Now, other pitfalls about fad diets we could think of as more, more mental emotional reactions. And one is what we call the nocebo effect. So once you're taught to believe that something is bad or harmful, you'll look for ways to confirm that. And that can mean attributing symptoms that are just not significant to the wrong things. But that can also mean symptoms that completely emerge and are totally real and totally measurable. So you can have gut inflammation increase if you expect a food to cause gut inflammation. That's, that's been shown. And what can happen too is that we can get so fixated on the right way to eat that we get fearful about food. You know, this has been called orthorexia or, you know, correct eating. And if you're not eating in that correct way, bad things can happen is the belief. And that belief itself is really powerful. So those are all pitfalls by which fad diets can be deleterious. The main point of this is to really say that please free your mind and please know that even if something seemed to be helpful or seemed to make sense, it may not be the best thing for you long term. And your body's needs may change. And a few principles are really strong in nutrition. We do better getting optimal amounts of total fuel. You know, not way too much, not too little. We also need to get certain amounts of essential nutrients. And we need to get a big diversity of healthy foods. But the extreme restrictions, the fad diets, even if they seem to work in the short term, they may work against you in the long term. So enjoy a good meal. Take great care. We'll talk in really soon. Bye-bye.